There were 12 of us to begin with, by Ian Gordon. With thanks to our producers, Ashley Lindsay, Robert Daniel Picard, Wes Sale, and Cameron Seegers. Chapter 3, Grey Dagger, December 26th, 1989. The tall, slender girl who had been given the moniker Grey Dagger knew exactly where the library was, and not just because she'd looked in on it early that afternoon. She was, of course, a stooge. It wasn't the first time she'd played such a part. She'd played the role of Luna Sola three years running in the Summer Kill shows in Rillington, the part of Andrea Butcher, the murderer's assistant in Buxton Manor's Halloween Haunting of 85, not to mention the role of Rita Reel in Bakewell's Spring Blackout events, 87 to 88. But it was her part as the stooge with no name in Harry O'Grady's Miller Madness 86 that familiarized the young performer with Miller's Manor and its extensive grounds. She had been thrilled to land a role in Murder at Miller's Manor. It was advertised as an exclusive event, in which only persons meeting specific criteria would be chosen to participate, and this applied to both stooges and contestants. The fee wasn't bad either, a cool thousand for twelve days' work. Being familiar with the place was just a bonus. Though she hadn't met physically with the event organizers, she discussed her part in some detail with a representative over the telephone, agreeing upon the basic terms of the contract and what would be required of her. She'd been a little peeved that she wouldn't be able to meet with the games master or host beforehand, but the agent had insisted that the organizer took their events very seriously, and that the anonymity of the host was of the greatest importance. Whether or not the host, or killer, would be playing the part of a guest, or conducting their murderous business from the shadows, the girl remained in the dark. Even the identities of the other stooges would be withheld, which she felt was a little strange, given that stooges typically worked together to ensure events stayed on course. But all in all, the gig was a no-brainer for the young performer, and she had been eager to get the ball rolling. The library, located at the end of a vast corridor connected to the Grand Hall, was in itself a large rectangular space over two levels, with no external windows. Its walls were covered entirely with floor-to-ceiling shelves, upon which abundant, anonymous-looking brass and leather-bound tomes reposed. A spiral staircase made of iron stood in the northwest corner, climbing to a narrow balcony overlooking the room below, providing access to further nameless volumes the highest rows of which were obscured by long-abandoned cobwebs. In the middle of the space stood a substantial reading table. Upon it, open to its first page, was a large book in green hardcover, presumably the rule-book or guide-book. Grey Dagger led the other contestants directly to it, a revealing act, but a necessary one. Surrounding the table, the guests gawped at the open book before them, and, as soon as he laid his eyes upon it, Green Drake, the enthusiastic man in the brightly coloured dress shirt, read aloud, The Crimes of the Hypothetical Somebody. Those were the words printed on the left hand page or verso of the book. The right hand page or recto featured an illustration. Is that us? Scarlet Darter asked, twisting the end of his moustache between thumb and forefinger. Sure looks like it, Green Drake answered on behalf of the collective. The illustration was indeed a representation of twelve upright figures surrounding a table, in what was assuredly the library in which they were presently standing. The crudely sketched individuals were keenly focused on an item upon the table, which, just as the case was in the actual library, was a large open book. Huh, Longhorn muttered impassively. What does it mean? Grey Dagger asked, playing her part convincingly. Who knows? added New Forest a blank expression filling her small face. "'The crimes of the hypothetical somebody,' whispered Nightcrawler, a delayed reiteration of Green Drake's initial vocalization of the words on the versa. "'Mean something to you?' Green Drake quizzed. Nightcrawler shook his head dismissively. Spurred on by something approaching enthusiasm, 
Black Garden, the reserved fellow in the Fair Isle cardigan, reached out and turned the page. Andrina, the jovial but most vertically challenged of the ensemble, asked from her position at the rear, "'What does it say?' A hesitant silence followed, broken finally by the latecomer, Blue Bottle. "'Here, let's have a look,' he said, motioning to Black Garden for the book. Black Garden slid the book in his direction, and, if only to appease the ever-pleasant Andrina, Blue Bottle began to read from the book aloud. "'Listen long, and hear my song. We've met before, you and I, probably, passed each other on the street, exchanged glances. But you won't remember me. Nobody ever does. But you see, that's the beauty of it. I'm invisible. I can go anywhere, do anything. And the things I've done you wouldn't believe. Perhaps I'm plain, ordinary, you might say. Simply forgettable, like the washing of one's hands, or the tying of one's shoelaces. Well, ordinary or not, forgettable or not, the twelve of you are here today, and you're here to play my game. The game of the hypothetical somebody. The one who doesn't exist. The one who, by all intents and purposes, shouldn't exist. Blue Bottle paused. Is that it? Longhorn asked, in the same inexpressive manner. No, it goes on. But I know what you're thinking. The crimes. What about the crimes? Well, let me tell you about the crimes. There will be a number of fatalities here within the walls of Miller's Manor over the twelve days of Christmas. Deaths attributed to none other than me, the hypothetical somebody. I will stalk the halls and pick you off one by one, until only I remain. Unless, of course, one or several among you are clever enough to catch me in the act. Again, Blue Bottle paused to catch his breath, then continued. Who am I, I hear you asking? Am I a stranger to you all, even at this very moment watching from some hidden place, secreted away? Or am I standing beside you right now, the warmth of my body radiating next to yours? Blue Bottle took a moment to cast suspicious glances in the direction of his present company. Similar glances met his own, including that of Grey Dagger, the stooge, who, having listened to the words of the host, was struggling to understand just how the games master intended to falsify the deaths of a dozen guests in order to achieve his or her implied victory. Blue Bottle concluded, And so your objective should be clear, ladies and gentlemen. You've a killer to catch. But if you've any doubts as to my veracity, let me assure you that this is unequivocally a fair game. Catch the killer, and the killer will crown you victor. Blue Bottle turned the page, anticipating further notes and or instructions, but the rest of the book consisted of blank pages. Grey Dagger was the first to break the silence, addressing Blue Bottle. Wait, if you're only here to wait out the bad weather, then what happened to the twelfth guest? What? False Widow answered on Blue Bottle's behalf. The book mentions twelve guests, twelve people in the illustration, too. If Blue Bottle isn't supposed to be here, then what happened to the person who was? Oh, I see, False Widow acknowledged. Last-minute jitters? Change of heart? Not likely, Longhorn interjected. Oh, I wouldn't say that. White Admiral slurred, the alcohol on his breath, an unwelcome aroma to the guests in his immediate vicinity. Nerves can get to you. Nightcrawler, standing tall and casting suspicious eyes at Blue Bottle, said, Well, he says he's here to wait out the bad weather. Blue Bottle, quite calmly, held his hands up in the air and said, Whoa, whoa, hold it there. I'm not the games master, if that's what you're implying. Oh, right. Nightcrawler returned testily, and I guess we're supposed to just take your word for it. Grey Dagger, sensing an unwelcome change of tone, did what she had been hired to do, and steered the group back on course. Okay, lads, let's nip it in the bud, shall we? It's a little early in the game for accusations. We haven't even seen a murder yet. She's right, Longhorn agreed, placing her hands on the table. I, for one, am absolutely knackered. I think we should grab our luggage and find our rooms. Grey Dagger eyeballed Longhorn with something like familiarity. A fellow stooge, for sure. She'd had her suspicions earlier in the day with regards to the lady's role in the game, and now, with the talk of sleeping quarters, was absolutely certain that Longhorn's function was to ensure that the contestants were assigned rooms. And so, following some brief discussion regarding the open book and its unusual contents, the guests returned to the Grand Hall in order to collect their bags. 
The guest rooms were located on the first floor, each accessed via the gallery situated at the top of the stairs overlooking the Grand Hall. The act of finding one's room was as simple as locating his or her code name affixed to one of twelve particular doors. As the other guests filed away, all with relative ease, apart from White Admiral, whose inebriation had made it almost impossible for him to read the code name on his door, Grey Dagger located her quarters, stepped inside, and locked the door behind her, as per the instructions she had been given. Her task that evening was to play the role of victim number one. She'd initially balked at the idea of betraying a corpse, as her previous experiences had seen her in more active roles. But it wasn't so much the idea of playing dead that bothered her, it was the staying dead. Instructions had been provided as to where she would need to go following her demise, or in this case, disappearance, but with the ever-increasing intensity of the snowstorm without, she suddenly started to doubt whether or not such an ambitious game was in fact feasible under such conditions. She made herself comfortable in the sizable room. Like all the guest rooms, it was a traditional suite, complete with king-size bed, eerie, watchful portraits, chic nightstands, freestanding mirror, and, of course, obligatory ensuite bathroom. The window on the north wall was supposed to overlook the manor's extensive grounds, including the grand water fountains and the walled garden, but, on the evening of December 26, 1989, the window was little more than a shield from the elements. Nothing could be seen beyond that single pane of glass, other than a dark mass of compacted snowflakes. Grey Dagger shuddered at the thought of being out there in the blizzard, naked before creation. But just then her thoughts returned to her present situation, and the thorny issue of her disappearance. The morning of the 27th, at precisely 7 a.m., the sleeping contestants woke to the sound of clock striking on the ground floor. Drowsy, and in the case of White Admiral, hung over, the guests dragged themselves from the warmth of their beds, slipped into the provided dressing gowns, and descended the stairs. There, in the grand hall, five grandfather clocks were chiming in perfect synchronization, their elegant facades draped with cheap tinsel. Upon reaching the grand hall, False Widow, who was always quick on her feet early in the morning, wasn't so much attracted to the sound of the striking clocks as she was to the smell of toast wafting from the dining room. She moved in the direction of the dining room, just north of the reception hall, and found that she wasn't the first to rise. Longhorn, her black hair tied up in a bun, was in the act of toasting bread. The toaster was on the west wall, alongside a number of food items laid out on a breakfast bar, including croissant, yogurt, fruit, and the like. Who put all this together? False Widow asked. I did, Longhorn replied casually. The kitchen is fully stocked. You knew that, right? Hesitantly, False Widow nodded. She hadn't read any of the event literature beforehand. Green Drake appeared behind her moments later, wearing a similar befuddled expression. Who's serving breakfast? he asked. False Widow said, Longhorn, apparently. Over the ensuing fifteen minutes or so, the other contestants managed to find their way to the dining room, each of which, having asked the question of who it was that had prepared their food, had enjoyed a bite to eat with fresh tea and coffee. All, that is, with the exception of Grey Dagger. But there was nothing strange about that, quite to the contrary, especially as far as the enthusiastic Green Drake was concerned. The disappearance of Grey Dagger was a clear indicator that the game had begun. Swallowing his last mouthful of Earl Grey, the excitable man rushed off to his room to dress. And so, the eleven guests, sated following a continental breakfast courtesy of Longhorn, went in quest of Grey Dagger, beginning their search in the last place she'd been seen, her bedroom. But there was a degree of confusion when, upon inspection, a thorough search of the room at the northeasternmost end of the gallery yielded no evidence to suggest a murder had taken place. Even the bed was made, indicating the girl had risen, or perhaps implied that she hadn't actually made it to bed in the first place. Throughout their investigation into Grey Dagger's disappearance, White Admiral, whose banging head wasn't at all helpful in the search, continued to remind himself that she had been one of his two suspects, one of the women who had so roused his suspicions upon their arrival the day before. He felt, rather confidently, that if Grey Dagger had perished at the hand of the host on night one, that his other suspect, the lady known as Longhorn, was very likely to be the one responsible for her disappearance. 
and this, to his mind, was further substantiated by the fact that it was Longhorn who just so happened to be the one who prepared breakfast that morning. But he needed to be certain, and, unfortunately, his pounding head did little by way of providing clarity of mind. Noon came and went, but there was still no sign of Grey Dagger. In the minds of the investigating guests, the lack of evidence in her wake was a little disheartening. Many of them had expected more from murder at Miller's Manor. But then again, others among them believed the lack of evidence was a good thing. To give too much away too early was to put a premature end to what, after all, was a relatively expensive event. For those who had read the small print, the event had been billed as a self-catering affair, one in which food would be provided, but under the proviso that the contestants cooked for themselves. As the day had advanced, with nothing coming to light regarding the missing guest, the kitchen, wherein fresh coffee, alcohol, and numerous foodstuffs were plentiful, became the logical place to loiter. As evening fell upon Miller's manor, the contestants adjourned to their rooms, each of them somewhat tired and deflated, having turned to alcohol as a more feasible means of passing the time. That is, ten of the eleven remaining contestants adjourned to their rooms. One of them never left the ground floor. Thanks for listening today, ladies and gents. Be sure to join us again tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for the next part of There Were Twelve of Us to Begin With. And until then... Thank you.